guys. Welcome to Cryptids Canada. I hope everybody's having a great day. So just a quick mention about the Bigfoot Finders book contest. All the winners have been notified by email. However, there's been a couple who have not responded with their address information. So please make sure you check the email and follow the instructions. Okay, so enough of the jibber jabber. Let's get to the video. Hi, Leslie. I'm writing about an experience that happened quite a few years back. My girlfriend at the time, but now she's my wife, Syl, and I are what you might call thrill seekers. Technically, we don't call ourselves that. That's just what we've been called. Because we love life and we want to try it all. We have hiked all over the U.S. and Canada. Both of us are teachers and we hold down two jobs sometimes at a time just to save as much money as we can so that we can spend our summers experiencing absolutely amazing places. So this particular experience took place in Montana. Sill's sister Jillia and I had never met. She invited us to do a camp with her and her boyfriend Calvin for a week in July of 2012. They said it was a cabin that was on stilts, fashioned to look like a fire tower. They said it might have been an old fire tower, but they weren't sure. Friends of theirs had stayed there, and they said the views were spectacular. We gave them our credit card number so they could secure the cabin, and then they were going to settle up when we got there. So rewind to that day in July of 2012. They picked us up from the airport, and we went back to their apartment for a couple of days to get ready. Sills and I had stayed at fire tower cabins before, and this was nothing like that. Apparently, this cabin offered everything. Bedding, pots and pans, firewood, and all of that. Except there was no water or electricity. However, there was a shed that housed a generator and stacks of firewood, and if you contacted the owner, they would give you a code to allow you to open the shed to have access to those items for an extra charge, of course. So once we were all organized, we started out. It was only an hour or so drive to a small town called Sula, and apparently this place was just a little past there. We decided to take their two cars to make sure we had more than enough room to bring everything we needed. We followed Calvin and Julia up a pretty gnarly dirt and gravel road that went up a small mountain. It was a really narrow road between thick pine forests on both sides. Finally, we arrived at the top of the mountain. It seemed to be completely flat and square, with the cabin right in the middle. The whole area reminded me of a parking lot. The cabin itself was built about 10 feet up on stilts, the whole cabin was like 20 by 20 feet square, with windows all around it. Sills just told me that I'm being very generous with the size, but I'm not good with measurements. Every window had wooden shutters on the outside that could be shut from the inside and the outside as well. And there were three sets of bunk beds, plus a small pull-out couch. Then a big wood cook stove and a picnic table. It was so rustic, but so beautiful at the same time. There was an outhouse that none of us knew about, but oh well. Then in the center of the room, there was a pull-down ladder that took you to a square room with windows all around it as well. They called it the lookout tower. The whole cabin was made to enjoy the view. Right from the get-go, I was put off by Calvin. He was a know-it-all. Plus, I found out after we arrived that we had paid the whole rental fee of the cabin, and they were supposed to pay up their half a few days earlier. Syl didn't bring it up because she wanted me to have a good time. I overheard her and Julia speaking about it, and Syl was right, but I shut my mouth and pretended not to hear. So, we were starting a campfire outside to have a quick meal of hot dogs on a stick when a car pulled up. Turns out that Calvin invited a few friends to tent camp for the weekend, which was not permitted, 
and extra charges were put on my credit card for it. But by nine o'clock that evening, three more cars showed up and the tents were going up all over the place and alcohol was flowing. I'm a recovering alcoholic, so I struggled a little, but I stayed sober. When we were invited, Sills informed them and they had no problem not drinking. I never said anything, but Sills reminded Julia and Calvin and Calvin said, there's no way I'm telling my friends that they can't drink on their holidays. Then the music started blaring from the beefed-up 4x4 pickup truck. This was not how we enjoyed our nature. Julia and Sills were also ticked right off. Calvin and his friends were just taking over the cabin that I had paid for. One of the cars ended up leaving because the people were fighting. But by the next day, there were six extra people in and out of the cabin, helping themselves to coffee and breakfast. That whole day went on like that. Julia, Sill, and I went for a hike, and when we got back, the three other women were making dinner with our food. As it started getting dark, the alcohol started really flowing, and the music got louder and louder. Believe me when I say, Julia was just as upset as we were. She threatened Calvin that if he didn't get his friends reined in, that she was going to go and take all the money out of his account to pay for the whole vacation because he was ruining it for everyone. It was like these people were doing everything they could to get us mad. So Sills, Jillia, and I went into the tower to do some stargazing as the party below was in full swing. After I heard the comment about the drinking, I made the decision that I couldn't control who pitched a tent outside, but not one person was coming into the cabin, especially when there was a thunderstorm predicted for some time in the middle of the night. If Calvin put up a stink, he can join them outside. By this point, I wasn't even trying to respect their relationship anymore. Julia was seething just as much as we were. It was about 10 p.m. when we heard a car window smash. It turned out to be the back window of the 4 by 4 that was blaring the music. For the first time, the music got shut off. They were trying to figure out where the rock came from. We were watching from the tower to see if we could see where it came from as well. Calvin and the three guys were standing there looking around, and then he came running into the cabin. He stood at the ladder, looking up at us, screaming this high-pitched scream. He was actually accusing us of being the ones that threw the rock. He honestly sounded like a woman, lol. Actually a combination of a woman and five foxes freaking out. As he stood at the bottom of the ladder having his temper tantrum, I had had enough. I told Calvin to shut up and get out of the rental cabin. He was stunned into silence because until then, I had held my tongue all along, because I didn't want to cause problems for my sister-in-law. Because all of the windows had been opened, the friends all heard that it wasn't Calvin's rental, and that he was out of line by inviting all his friends. But nothing really changed. At that moment, we heard what did sort of sound like a mixture of Fox and Satan roaring from the depths of hell. By this point, Julia was so furious and embarrassed that her boyfriend and his friends had to take advantage of her sister and brother-in-law to be able to afford a camping trip. She told Calvin to tell them to leave right now or he would be locked out as well and that the cops would be called and that they would be over forever. He shared a few choice words with her and went out the door, slamming it behind him. She ran after him and locked it. She had had enough. She went from window to window, closing the shutters. Syl and I were getting nervous because the screams that we were hearing were so loud. So we went down to help Julia close the windows and shutters. Then we started hearing the loud, horrendous screams again, and we ran back upstairs to see if we could see where it was coming from. We could see the seven of them standing beside the fire in a tight circle, looking over their shoulders. 
Then we saw them look towards the cabin, and Calvin's arms were flapping, as if it wasn't his fault. Then the big jerk who owned the truck started marching towards the cabin, like he was going to handle everything. I told Julia to stay in the tower, and I answered the door. He accused us of locking them out, and I said, No, not completely true. We were protecting ourselves from whatever you guys have pissed off. He said we were all being stupid and immature. Then he said, look, something's out there and it sounds dangerous. And if he was able to settle everyone down, could they just come in and sleep and then leave in the morning? I told him to hold on and I went to talk to Sills and Julia. Then he got aggressive and said, what's the problem, Julia? If she could have her friends, why couldn't Calvin have his friends? Case closed. He slammed the door and screamed for everyone to hurry up, that they were allowed to come inside. We watched as everyone was grabbing their bags and suitcases from their tents. We saw what we now know was a Bigfoot run from one side of the driveway to the road. The girls were loud and yelling yeehaws for some stupid reason. And then, as clear as day, I watched the one Bigfoot step out from behind the trees and throw a rock at the one girl like he was pitching for the New York Yankees. It hit her right in the back. She let out a scream and was jumping up and down, grabbing at her back, screaming, it hit me, it hit me. Her two friends tried to run to her, but they were so inebriated they were tripping over their own feet. Now that we actually saw what was behind the horrific screams and the windshield smashing, This was no joke. And now that this girl had actually gotten hit by one of these rocks, they were also panicking. Finally, they were all inside, and sure enough, someone pulled out the speaker and started playing music. I came down the stairs at the end of my rope, and I told them all to shut up. I pointed at the only guy who didn't seem to be too drunk, and I said, Hey, do you want to see what's outside making those noises? And he said, Yeah, sure. So he followed me up, and then, of course, the other three guys followed him. They all stood there watching, and at last they finally saw the one Bigfoot. And then we saw two more run up behind the big 4 by 4 They all expressed complete fear. One of them asked if it was a Bigfoot, and the other guy said, Yeah, obviously. We could now see how big they were standing beside the back of the truck. Their idiot girlfriends were still screaming and blasting the music from the speakers. The three guys went downstairs and turned the music off. One of the girls started getting violent and she said she was leaving. When her man tried to stop her, she attacked him. And he said, listen, these are friggin' monsters out there. And of course she called him a liar. So he forced her to the tower and the other girls followed, of course. After a while... They saw the one peek out from behind the truck. At this point, they had all seen them, and they were all panicking. We had all managed to watch them from the tower without detection, because we were just sitting quietly. But now these girls getting pushy and yelling, I want to see, I want to see. So I whispered for everyone to go back downstairs. Of course, then Calvin said, Who the hell are you talking to? These are my guests. Then Julia said, No, you know what? You didn't pay for any of this. This rental belongs to Sill and Bento. So if you want to be able to stay, then I would shut up. He was stunned that Julia had told him off in front of his friends. All of a sudden, the window broke right beside where I was standing, and I whispered, Go downstairs, which they did. I was trying to see where they were. It was pitch black in the room, so I don't know how they could see us. There was ten of us shoved in this tiny room, and all I could smell was alcohol. It was awful for me, so I opted to go back up to the lookout room. There was glass everywhere, but I shoved it to the side, and I peeked out the broken window. I saw, in the very short period that I was downstairs, maybe ten minutes, that the two Bigfoot had ripped the three tents out of the ground and they were just blowing up against the wood line from the wind. 
I could hear the front door open, so I went downstairs to see who opened it, and one of the couples had their weapons in hand and decided to make a run for it. There was another couple who was also going to run for it if the first couple made it to their cars. The first set didn't even make it down the steps when the screaming started and the rocks started hitting their marks. They couldn't even shoot them because none of us could see where they were hiding anymore. The first two ran past the second two and back inside the cabin. I finally got everybody settling down and being quiet. I think the blaring music and the screaming was setting them off. Finally, the thunderstorm started, and the winds were blowing and screaming and yelling outside finally calmed down. I think that all three of the Bigfoot took cover and left us alone. We all laid down and got some sleep. Mind you, every single bed had two adults in it, and it wasn't a great night for sleeping. The next day it was dull and overcast, but we all made a run for the cars and got out of there. When I called the owner of the cabin to let them know why there was damage to the windows, they claimed to know that there were Bigfoot in the area, and that was one of the reasons that loud music was not recommended nor tolerated. I ended up paying for everything. That was the last time we went to Montana. I don't have the same interest in seeing these creatures like every one of you do. I like the community because I like learning about what's going on, but it concerns me that so many of you think these are just peaceful creatures. Most people don't realize what kind of sounds these things are capable of making. It's not something that we hear in our normal world. They just don't want us coming into their space and infecting them with our noise, electronics, and garbage. You don't see them walking around the cities and neighborhoods. Be respectful when you're in nature. Don't be difficult. Sign Bento da Silva. And then I actually received another email from them a little while later saying that Julia found out that the tower cabin was torn down years ago and the land was sold and now there's a multi-million dollar home sitting where the cabin used to be. And that is it for that story. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. Do me a favor, guys. Hit that like button. Hit the bell if you want notifications of when I'm uploading. And of course, subscribe. You know I love ya. We'll see you back here in a day or two. Bye for now.